Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. At that time, the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle Jesus and his words, and they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully. And you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. My dear brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, perhaps you have encountered the expression, but you promised. You promised. This refrain is a common thread in relationships whether it's with your child, with your spouse, with a friend, a neighbor, or a colleague. How often have we found ourselves breaking one promise to fulfill another? Haven't we faced conflict between what we feel forced to do and what we know we freely ought to do. The temporal, the temporal appears to take precedence over the eternal. Jesus faced a similar situation when his adversaries sought to push him to choose between two options that would lead to equally adverse or bad outcomes. His response, however, cleverly shifted the focus of their question by challenging them to prioritize their values. The readings of today give us a perspective on how God makes cho a choice. His choices offer us a perspective that is both challenging and surprising. In the first reading, we have Cyrus, a total outsider, who is chosen by the Lord God as Messiah in Aramaic, Christos, the same word in Greek, the Anointed One in English. This will be, mind you, the title God will give Jesus 500 years later in the New Testament. We would hardly choose an outsider, a non-Jew, to restore the Jews back to the Promised Land, as Moses had done the first time. The surprise is that Cyrus is given a commission to deliver Israel from the hands of the Babylonians. This would be a shock to the Jews as Cyrus does not himself accept Yahweh. He does not become a Jew. He remains an outsider. Yet, with Cyrus, the door is opened for the nations to recognize Israel and their Lord Yahweh. At that moment, that was all that mattered. God has kept his promise 
that Israel will be a light to the nations. The second reading, St. Paul, after his conversion, is addressing his first converts by letter, 1 Thessalonians. This letter to the Thessalonians is the first of the many letters he will write to the churches. In Acts, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17, we hear of the turmoil Paul had to face in Thessalonica. He could have run away, but he did not want to leave the Thessalonians, his new converts, to be victimized by forces that were hostile to him personally. Paul does not leave them in the lurch. He gets his priorities right. His proclamation, he knows, is by the power of the Holy Spirit. He can vouch for the power of the Spirit acting on the people in Thessalonica. He can see that. Not only is he moved by the Spirit, he can see how the people are also moved by the Spirit. He recognizes their faith, their newfound faith, and it is not an empty faith. It is a faith that is seen in action, which is moved by love and perseveres through hope. The gospel shows Jesus in debate with the, Her with the Pharisees and the Herodians. These two groups are not natural allies. At other times, they are quite antagonistic towards each other. The Herodians support the rule of Herod, who has cooperated with the Roman rulers and has been given authority by them as a client king. The Pharisees, on the other hand, were legalists among the Jewish leaders and believed that their interpretation of the law was the one to be obeyed. The two are actually on the opposite side of the fence, but now they have come together against Jesus. The question is about tax. Should a Jew pay the tax, the yearly tax, or not? The Pharisees would be averse to it, but not the Herodians. One of the imposed taxes was the head tax, equivalent to a day's wage, a denarius, to be paid by every Jew without distinction. The tax was paid in Roman coinage, and the coin at that time had the imprint of Emperor Tiberius on it, with the inscription, Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus, high priest. For the Jew, for a coin to have that imprint of someone the emperor has divine would be blasphemous. Jesus is aware now of the trap being set for him. If he agrees to the tax, the Pharisees would attack him. For it would mean that Jesus has agreed uh, that, the divine, uh, that the Caesar is divine. But if he agreed with the Pharisees not to pay the tax, the Herodians would look at him as subversive and they would immediately arrest him. But how does Jesus answer? In fact, he does not answer their question at all. He makes them answer their own question. Why do you set this trap for me? Let me see the denarius. Whose image do you see on it? When they answer Caesar's, he replies, therefore, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Does not stop there. And to God what belongs to God. What has Jesus done? Has he told them to pay the tax? It would appear so. But he has given them the larger picture. 
He says, look at the bigger picture. You come here with a little coin, but you neglect to look at yourselves who have the imprint of God's image on you. Where do your priorities lie? Handing over a coin to Caesar pales in significance to what Jesus will do. He will hand himself over to the Romans to be crucified. For Jesus, that was doing God's will. You want to know if one should pay the tax to Caesar, but why are you unmindful of what you owe to God whose image you bear on your soul? Yes, there are two kinds of giving. One, a temporal to Caesar. The other, eternal to God. The image of Caesar on the coin is transient. It will pass. Why? When a new emperor comes, a new image will be imprinted on the coin. Because emperors change. But the image of God on your soul is forever unchanging. It's eternal. The payment of one denarius has head tax has not set you free. But the image of God on your soul has set you free already. So let go of the coin, give it to Caesar, but hold fast to God for dear life. Jesus invites us, dear friends, to hand ourselves over to God, not in part, but whole and entire, just as Jesus handed himself over. It is in such handing over our lives to God that we actually realize our identity as his children. It is, handing, it is in handing myself over to God I discover my true worth. That my worth is not transient. It is eternal because I am made for eternity. In today's readings, therefore, dear friends, we are told we know that God has the last word. It is he who matters and directs our lives. Economic questions, yes, they are important. But don't get carried away by them. For these questions also involve power and domination, one over the other. They are often concerned only with temporal realities. They involve the manipulation of the weaker by the stronger, the poorer by the richer. But if you learn how to give God what belongs to God, then everything will fall in place. Today is Mission Sunday. And as we celebrate this important occasion, we realize that we are missionaries because we have the imprint of God on our souls. His image, his likeness we bear. And as missionaries, this is the first aspect that we must consider. That we go to others knowing that we bring God to them. That is a missionary. What is God's due will be expressed more clearly next Sunday when you hear the gospel. Love God with everything you have, your heart, your mind, your soul, and love your neighbor. As you love yourself, that means put him first. And this picture, my dear friends, is the total opposite of everything Caesar stood for and Rome was built on. Let us thank God for his image and likeness that he has given us that we bear 
the fact that we bear it for all eternity, the fact that we are made for all eternity. God's greatest gift to the world is the Holy Spirit. He remains the pledge who constantly reminds us of who we are and our eternal habitation. In this Eucharist then, may we join Jesus in his self-offering to the Father as we also strive to give to God our very selves. For the sake of his image and likeness, we bear. Amen.